Welcome back to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers, the podcast devoted to exploring the frontiers of psychedelic medicine and what it takes to cultivate a healthy mind, body, and spirit. I'm clinical psychologist Dr. Steve Thayer, and today my co-host Dr. Reed Robison and I discuss whether or not psychedelic medicine can change your personality. We explore the concepts of personality and temperament generally, discuss ways that we measure personality, we talk about the environmental and genetic influences on personality development, and much, much more. Please like, rate, subscribe to, and share the podcast if you find it valuable. I know that um, you know every podcaster asks you to do that, and most of us, including myself, don't end up doing those things, but we would really appreciate it. Give us, uh, you have the opportunity to give us up to a five-star review on platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. So if you're feeling generous, please do so. If you'd like to ask us any questions or give us episode or guest suggestions, you can email us at psychfrontiers at novamind.ca. Please enjoy the show. All right, everybody, welcome back to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers. I'm Dr. Steve Thayer here with my intrepid colleague, Dr. Reed Robison. How you doing, Reed? Excellent. How are back. you? I'm good, man. I'm good. We're back in the studio. Mm-hmm. It's all recovered from the nasty coronavirus. Yeah, I did my quarantine duties. Yeah. <laughs> back at it. I, there were some fun Instagram posts on your Instagram uh, <laughs> of, of the Robison family quarantining. Yeah, yeah, we had we had a good time. Yeah. <laughs> My two kids who were quarantining with me said on multiple occasions, I kind of like quarantine mm. because I don't know, there was just so much downtime without obligations to be anywhere. I know this is a hot topic and right. I don't want to be insensitive to uh the the terrible side of the pandemic and sure. quarantine and the impact on so many people's lives. But uh, for me, in a go, go, go kind of state, it was nice to have some time for stillness. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Time for stillness, indeed. Um, So today, we're going to talk about personality, but in particular, Mm -hmm. the idea that, or the question, we're going to explore that question, can psychedelic use or psychedelic therapy change a person's personality? This is... (laughs) The short answer is maybe, but we're going to kind of get into into the details. Yeah, it's a fun question, yeah. and uh, we can just skip right to the answer. Yeah, maybe it can. Will yeah. it last? Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I, I like to call it uh, altered states for altered traits sometimes. Yeah. It's just uh, like a that. fun way to think about it. Yeah, and so when you when you talk when you ask the question like what is personality? Can personality change? What's the relationship between personality and what we call temperament? It kind mm-hmm. of evokes this other maybe more existential question of uh, how do we become who we are? Um, older philosophical questions of are we tabula rasa? Are we blank slates <laughs> that uh, we come into this world a blank tablet that our experience etches upon us who we are, or do we come into the world? predestined to be who we are? Does our genetic code and what we've inherited from our parents already have in it the blueprint of whether or not you're going to be, you know, conscientious or anxious or gritty or whatever? I, I was going to say, I love this debate, but I actually really hate this debate, (laughs) but I have an easy answer or opinion on it is it's not nature versus nurture. It never is, never was. It's always both. Right. In, in my opinion, the question is how much of a, of a genetic component and how much of an environmental. Um, but I like the biopsychosocial framework we use in mental health to understand people because it talks about the biological deck of cards you're built, the, the kind of individual idiosyncrasies that we that we acquire along the way, um, and then the societal cultural factors that play a big role. Yeah. Uh, and I think if you hard pressed most experts nowadays, they're gonna have a similar conclusion to yours that it's both, right? Um, there aren't a lot of, at least not that I'm aware of, a lot of like very staunch biological determinists out there. Um, they, I mean, they exist. In fact, I think I heard an interview on maybe Sam Harris's podcast a long time ago with with a geneticist who that was basically his opinion and did a lot of research around like, hey, 
yeah, there are some maybe little tweaks that experience can make to the way a person develops. Um, but your genes, your genes are everything. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know that genes are, I mean, you're picking the example of the person who was a uh, hardcore determinist, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but genes mean a lot. But if you think about from the moment of conception or in utero, even the environmental influences, to use one silly example, um, you know, you're born with a certain form and structure and mm -hmm. bone structure. If you lay on your, as a baby in your crib, you lay on your back, like the back of your head for too long, it will flatten and right. that's how it will be for the rest of your life. That's why they sell these little helmets around it or, um, or even in utero, if something's pushing up against you or some thing is ongoing, um, especially at a formative time, it'll make right. a big difference and set off a different course forever. Yeah. It's an yeah. E easy example of how the environment shapes who we are. And I was listening to a fitness podcast the other day and, and, uh, <laughs> one of the comments this guy made is, you know, don't ever ask a person with short arms, uh, tips on how to bench press better because that person has an advantage, right? You want to ask the oh. guy who can bench a lot, who's all arms, right? He's got long lanky arms because that person has had to overcome challenges. So there are yeah. some things about us when we come into the world that sort of, there's creates a feedback loop too on our experience. Uh, I think epigenetics is an example of one of those things that sort of uh, the discipline that proves uh, your point that yeah, genes what was the example you gave one time? Maybe you load the gun. Genetics loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger. Right, right. And that gene expression can change based on exposure to certain environmental stimuli, right? Yeah. And so that's the way I think of personality development is, sure, let's say, well, maybe we can talk about it in terms of temperament. This is something you know quite a bit about, right? So the difference between, at least as I think about it, personality and temperament Temperament is kind of uh, the, the way in which an infant, when you come into the world, metabolizes and reacts to their environment. And so, you know, if any of you have children, especially if you have more than one, you may have noticed that from the day they were born, they seemed to handle their world a bit differently. This is very apparent. So I have three children um, and two of my kids, okay? Uh, one of my children, since the day he was born, very sensitive to his environment. You know, he, he had a lot of food sensitivities, allergies. Uh, he startled really, really easily. I mean, you just move and he would startle. Uh, very sensitive to noise and um, difficult to sort of calm him down. Mm -hmm. And then, and he was very hyper-focused. Like he'd stare at your face. He, even when he was a little kid, he was very, very attentive and then I have my other son from the day he was born, who was relatively easy to calm down. You know, you couldn't startle him, loved being tickled, right? My other son, you, you know, don't touch me. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and just like the research on temperament would predict, my son who was born very sensitive to his environment has developed into a very thoughtful, deep introvert um, who is very sensitive to his environment. Uh, and which, which provides for him a lot of strengths and some challenges. And my other son, the one who was sort of easygoing and relaxed as a kid has developed into a sensation seeking extrovert uh -huh. who loves lots of stimuli in his world because he can handle it. Right. So, um, this was the, the research done, early research done on introversion and temperament and extroversion and temperament was done. I wrote it down by a guy named Jerome Kagan. Have you heard of him? Developmental psychologist? Yep. Yep. The longitudinal study study on, um, he started in 1989. It was, uh, 500 four month olds that he started with. And his, I think his disciple, uh, one of his grad students is carrying on the research now. Uh, these, these kids are much older now. Um, and those things that I just described that were, uh, exemplified by my two, my two boys, mm -hmm. um, was born out in his research too, how early childhood temperament sort of predicts later development on that introversion or extroversion spectrum. Yeah. Although I'd say it dates back even further. They're drawing on even Carl Jung's work. True. Uh, that was yeah. one of his big things was, was the extroversion, introversion, uh, dynamic in the personal and the collective unconscious. But did he coin those um, terms? He might have introversion and extroversion. 
Yeah, I'm, all, all he's you one of the personality experts who listens to us, or you're going to be very unimpressed by. Our uh, <laughs> there, and we're in, doing our best. Yeah, in our defense, there are a lot of personality theories and theorists yeah. <laughs> through the years, um, a lot mm-hmm. on all across this spectrum of uh, nature versus nurture. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, as a clinical psychologist, a lot of my training was around this, these notions of personality and how personality Mm -hmm. affects mental, the development of what we call mental illnesses and personality disorders. But yeah, it started with those early depth psychoanalysts, Freud, Jung, and Adler, Mm -hmm. talking about the, what the personality is and then it this uh, interplay between the id ego and super ego and how much mm-hmm. of it erupts from unconscious into consciousness. Maybe we should chat about that for a moment because I think Freud has more of an impact on uh, psychology and day-to-day life than we think. I mean, sure, we give, we give him a lot of credit, but it is interesting how the pendulum swung from the, the id, the ego, the super ego, uh, and a high, heavy focus on psychosexual development, the the role of of sex and desire right. in child development Libidinal energy and- to like Jung and others who kind of abandoned that but continue down the path of trying to understand what makes us tick right yeah and they they were you know those who talked about the importance of those early childhood experiences from their theoretical framework right freud as you stated, imagine that there was this libidinal energy that needed to be processed at certain crucial psychosexual stages. And if you didn't, it got, I think his term was cathected. It got stuck mm-hmm. at these stages when you would develop a fixation. So we have terms, like like you said, Freud's really influenced our the way we talk, even colloquially about our own psychology. So terms like a fixation, mm-hmm. this person's orally fixated yep. or they're anal. If you've ever been described as <laughs> anal or described somebody else as anal. Thanks, Freud. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's such a weird term out of context. Why would somebody who's really fastidious and orderly, why would that have anything to do with their butthole, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, because Freud thought it was the result of uh, botched potty training by your parents. And so you were anal retentive. You would retain your feces as a way of exerting control. And it manifested later in this adult personality style. It's fascinating how those things... Uh survive into day-to-day nomenclature yeah. with most people not even knowing where they come from. Yeah. 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 The word complex, you know, if you've ever said that somebody had an inferiority complex, I'm pretty sure that's a Jungian term or it might've been an Adlerian term. Uh, but one of those early psychoanalysts that we have these, uh, complexes that form around unmet needs and insecurities. Yeah. It's also interesting how we use words in different ways or, or these philosophers and researchers and psychologists did like the way Freud used ego is not how it's used in most circles today right. and including in psychedelics but he had the ego being so the id being our animalistic like primal desires drives and the super ego like would be what some might call the ego these days that control center of keeping everything overly in check and then the ego being the balance of those two yeah yeah so in the psychedelic world when you hear the term you know you often hear the the phrase ego dissolving Mm -hmm. that uh, a heavy dose of psychedelics will dissolve your ego or ego dissolution which is the same thing dissolving right Mm -hmm. and so they're not talking about that balancing act part of the the personality structure that freud was referencing right i think instead we're referring to ego as your selfhood your sense of self, right? Yeah, yeah. And these days, I mean, I like how the psychedelic field has brought a new kind of way of defining, describing ego. I quite like it. Mm -hmm. Um, And it lines up with how I see it neurobiologically as well. Like it's this collection of pathways governing, you know, our personal narratives and everything we think about ourselves, everything we have to do, our responsibilities, or this mission control center that you could also call the default mode network um, that we like to try and deconstruct, dissolve, or even (laughs) if you want to use the term ego death, if you want to absolutely obliterate during a deep psychedelic experience. And I think default mode is another way to think about personality and whether or not personality can change. Because, you know, in my mind, your personality is 
uh, the way you typically think about, feel about, and respond to things. Mm-hmm. Typically, right? It's your default mode. Your uh, yeah. The lens through which you view yourself and 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 the world. And people have come up with all kinds of different ways of describing what that lens looked like, the types of lenses that human beings typically have, um, which ones are better for certain kind of lifestyles versus others, or more gritty versus less gritty. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I think about it, and why psychedelics and psychedelic medicine are such potent tools mm-hmm. for exploring one's ego or personality because they they occasion these profoundly altered states that you were referring to earlier with your comment about altered states for altered traits and give you the opportunity to then maybe make some changes to that default mode. But I think like we've Mm -hmm. talked about in other episodes about psychedelic assisted therapy, in order for those changes to become a new default, so now we're talking about maybe even durable or permanent changes to one's personality, I think it typically takes more than five dried grams in silent darkness, right? I'm saying typically. I'm using a lot of hedge words because I don't know for sure. And then the research isn't super thorough on this yet. Well, that might be a good starting point. That might be the door opener Mm -hmm. or the way shower when it comes to changing one's personality. But it would just like um, our integration soapbox we like to get on is it would take repeated sustained effort to practice a trait to have it stick, mm-hmm. right? And and I think just to back up to the personality versus temperament discussion, you know, I like how you've put it together and it makes me kind of realize that what we're talking about is temperament being our, the deck of cards we're dealt with mm-hmm. or the the stuff you're born with, the traits, and then personality is that plus what it's all shaped into, that plus environment. And then our behavior is what we do with it. Personality yeah. is kind of who you have become. Yeah, yeah. The, the trappings can, that have sort of formed around it. And you can change it, even if it's not easy, even if it's not fast and overnight in many cases, although mm-hmm. there are some interesting psychedelic examples. But, you know, it makes me think of the Wizard of Oz <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and just how you had Dorothy on this uh, kind of wild spinning ride where her house gets transplanted to another dimension, but she meets these three friends who are all desperately wanting to change something about themselves. Like the Tin Man wants a heart, (laughs) Scarecrow wants a brain, the Lion wants courage, and they go on this like walkabout to try and find the wizard. It makes me think of psychedelics for some reason. Yeah, it seems like a trippy story. Yeah, the wizard who can magically bring that bring that for you but it but it makes me think of how often have most people wanted to change something like oh new year or new school new job i'm going in i'm an extrovert now watch this Mm -hmm. (laughs) but uh, in general it typically doesn't last for for many people well i think one of the reasons is that when we go against the grain of the temperament of what came naturally to us it requires a lot of effort it's, it's typically mm-hmm. not our default mode for a reason. And I like to talk about temperament because I think it helps people have compassion for themselves yeah. when they're trying to make changes they think they, they ought to make. And there's a, there's a conversation to be had about whether or not you should feel compelled to make changes, certain ones. Um, because it's like, oh, I see all these people and they're so gregarious. This, pers- this person at work is getting ahead because they're so talkative and they seem to have so much energy for interactions. And mm-hmm. I don't. I need to put myself out there. I need yeah. to be more talkative, but it's not easy for me. Well, it might not be easy for you because you literally have a more sensitive nervous system than other per- that than that other person. We call it introversion, right? And it's not a disease; it's uh-huh. a temperament. It's it's a it's a term we use to describe a certain type of human being. And introvert introversion has power. I'm feeling myself getting on a soap bo- soapbox right now because <laughs> I am an introvert. If uh, or I, I have um, introverted tendencies. Uh, I don't really love, <laughs> love the stark label, but um, and introverts, we we exist at least here in America in a con- in a country that was founded by uh, extroverted rapscallions and in a economic. What do I want to say without being speaking out of school here? <laughs> like an economic system that favors, I think, extrovert extroverts in some way. Yeah, not just our economics. I read this study 
not too long ago <laughs> that looked at how often introverts versus extroverts have sex on a monthly basis. Yeah. And yeah, it was it was interesting and in line with what you might guess. I mean, you might not guess the number, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I think it was. It's very different for males versus females, but introverts um, were somewhere in the to the tune of three times a month on average across this multi-thousand person survey, versus maybe five plus for right. extroverts. Um, and uh, yeah, it, ma it makes sense in the society we live in. I wonder um, if a study like that stratifies stratifies by like whether or not these couples are married, um, are these single individuals? Because I, I can think of uh, maybe an introverted couple that might um, like because they're together in their introvertedness, who might be having a lot of sex. Yeah. Um, whereas if you're a single introvert and going out and acquiring a sexual partner might be a huge leap for you. You might be having a lot less sex. Mm -hmm. And it's a good question. And I don't know the answer because I didn't read the full study, mm -hmm. but I do. Uh, yeah, I think it's a very good point. And we should have a whole episode one time on how to study a study and test yeah. a test and yeah. dissect papers because they're not all created equal yeah, for sure. Cause it's a great skill, especially these days. Yeah. Yeah, especially when people are saying, well, you know, go do your own research, whether it's do your own research about the pandemic or about some kind of political thing, these really hot button issues. Um, what do we mean by do your own research? Does that mean, well, I asked a bunch of people that already agree with mm -hmm. me and they told me that I should continue agreeing with myself. <laughs> or I found this study and what you mean is you found uh, a news organization that wrote a paper on that study and maybe emphasized certain points and de-emphasized others. Or do you actually know how to read original source material? And some of it's really hard to read. Yeah. I mean, even for us who, you know, we're professionals in this field and um, at least, well, I just, I'll speak for myself. Like I, I have a PhD in clinical psychology. I have, I have done original research. You know, I did a 200 page dissertation. I know how to use the scientific method to uh -huh. study the human mind. Um, but there are some studies that they have too much jargon for even me. Like <laughs> some of them are really hard to digest. Oh, oh yeah. And if you, if you can't, Ad admit that there's probably something wrong because there are very, very specific nuanced subspecialties out there yeah. that, uh, yeah, you can't have a handle on all of it, but you can learn to make sense of like the scientific literature in general. I think that's probably the number one skill I took out of med school is just exactly that, how to study a study yeah you know how to how to answer a question in an evidence-based manner and and f sift through some of this noise yeah but it certainly has its limitations like if I'm gonna read a you know uh, a fruit fly study on the brain versus uh, kind of behavioral science research it's gonna take me a lot longer to dive into the like the you know genetic model of fruit fly or some of these for swim maze tests and mice, things right. like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I share your reflection on uh, on college education. I, th I think the best thing I got out of my many years in college wasn't necessarily the content knowledge, although it was important. It was uh, learning how to learn. Critical like, thinking. Exactly, learning yeah. how to think, solve problems, think, think from first principles up yeah. and to deconstruct from top down. Yeah, and I think it's an example of how putting in those thousands of hours into something does shape our personality in a way or how you show up in the world and how you behave towards like information coming yeah. at us. Yeah. And that way personality is maybe like a choose your own adventure book. It only has <laughs> so many paths, maybe depending on our temperament, but you know, depending on which paths you take and how long you spend on those paths, it could really shape who you become. Yeah. Shape your personality. It, uh, it reminds me of what we say about the the ruts in the road um, with psychedelic medicine and with uh, habits in general is like every time, well, in this uh, neuroplasticity um, understanding that we have more and more in recent decades, um, every thought, every thing we do it lays it fires a new pathway of neurons and those get stronger and stronger and we really are what we repeatedly do um, 
And then there are these altered states or formative experiences or big, like, kind of emotional events, uh, including psychedelic trips that can uh, kind of provide a blank slate or flatten those ruts, kind of like a fresh coat of powder mm. on, a, on a ski slope. And then you do have a chance to more consciously choose those paths for a time or, um, yeah, similar to how you, when you do change jobs, schools, environments, it is somewhat of a reset, um, giving you at least a little bit more of a window to go for showing up in a new way. But if you don't practice it, it's not going to stick in general. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I remember in the military, we'd use this phrase, you'll, you'll default to your training. So mm-hmm. when the when the pressure is on, like you were saying, you are what you repeatedly do. Uh, what, what you know, neurons that fire together wire together. You can make efforts at change, but if those efforts aren't the consistent application of a specific behavior or specific way of thinking, enough that those neurons have a chance to form new pathways, um, then when the pressure is on, you're going to default to the strongest pathways in your brain that already exist. It's, it's why we put in therapy so much emphasis, at least the kind of therapy that I do, in how early childhood experiences uh, affected a person's nervous system development. Because you can, mm-hmm. as a grown-ass person, right, you're, de- you're de- totally developed human, um, and you're responding to certain threats in your environment in a way that baffles your, your ego, right? <laughs> it baffles oh, your yeah. conscious mind. Why do I keep doing that? Why do I keep falling for toxic guys? You know, <laughs> why do I keep stuffing my face with food that's going to make me feel gross. And I know it's going to make me feel gross. Why do I engage in these self-defeating behaviors? Well, it might be because early on in your life, and we talk about this in terms of our parts work too, right? But maybe early on in your life, certain pathways were laid down in response to some either really stressful stimuli in the form of a trauma or the absence of something that you needed, like love, affection, and acceptance and safety. And uh, that, that dies hard. Those early patterns don't go away without some serious effort and and insight. Yeah. And sometimes it takes a change in the environment, even like if you look at eating disorder, uh, therapy, treatment, rehabilitation, um, when it's, whether it's something like, uh, restrictive eating patterns and anorexia or binge eating patterns and binge eating disorder, like one of the most effective ways to treat it is to, provide another environment where there is support in the here and now when those um, those patterns show up and like there might be a trigger, a negative emotional state uh, turned to food to self-soothe. But when you have someone there saying, you got this, or, or when you have, you don't have your wide open fridge and no one watching, um, it's different. And then you spend a few days there, it starts to stick. You spend a few weeks there and it starts to become the new pathway, the new rut in the road. Right. Yeah. Interesting that we've moved from the early psychoanalysts to the behaviorists now. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about Skinner and, and, and Bandura. Uh, but I, I think they all have, they're all brilliant and have shreds mm-hmm. of truth in the way the human personality develops and how it can be changed. We skipped over the classic Phineas Gage story. Oh, yeah. Let's tell that story. Yeah. So this was in the 1840s. Phineas Gage working on a railroad and some explosives go off. A railroad tire, a rod. Tamping iron. Okay, tamping uh, iron. You would use it to tamp down the, the gunpowder, uh, the explosive powder inside of the hole to blow up the rocks, and it went off and shot through his skull, right? Through the left side of his skull and out the other end, and then all of a sudden, he was not a nice guy anymore. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, there were some... Yeah, he, he couldn't keep his appointments. He started swearing like mad. Yeah, short temper, mm-hmm. um, sexually inappropriate. And this, you know, people described him as a very mild-mannered dude before all this. So the only thing that changed, I mean, you could make the argument that the only thing that changed was the the meat in his skull, right? There was a traumatic injury to his prefrontal cortex. Uh, maybe some emotional trauma of getting a three-foot tamping iron shot through your skull. But uh, mm-hmm. and it, apparently it landed like... 40 meters away, like there's some serious, yeah, serious explosive power. Amazing that he, amazing that he survived. Yeah, it is. Um, 
And you see this in, in uh, dementia patients too, right? People with cognitive decline. A lot of times, they, even if their memory's intact, their their personalities change. Yeah, and it's it's predictable in a sense in terms of like the brain regions involved, like frontotemporal dementia, um, leading to more of that kind of disinhibited or change in what we might be defining here as personality traits. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's interesting to think about as we were talking about today, what makes us who we are, um, to think about the, the biology that is responsible for who we are as it interacts with our environment. So you could say that we are, I remember one of my graduate school professors saying, we're not just meat machines. We're not just meat puppets. Mm -hmm. Um, and then one of my other professors saying, well, yeah, we are, <laughs> that's all we are. We're programmable meat puppets, just the most complicated machines on the planet. Mm -hmm. And we're predictable in that way. Um, but yeah. I think, you know, you mentioned the biopsychosocial model of mental health earlier, and, and we've also talked about it, uh, a fourth component, the spiritual, right? Biopsychosocial spiritual model of who we are. And, um, I'm not as religious as I used to be, but back when I was more religious, especially in college, I would often think about this, like, okay. If I can get a brain injury and it makes me, um, you know, curse like a sailor at my wife, um, what does that say about my spirituality? Like, is there a non-corporeal component to who I am that lasts forever? I mean, I'm asking the unanswerable questions now, but mm -hmm. um, that has something to do with the way I behave. But if I can just change something in your brain and you behave differently... Um, and Sam Harris, actually, he makes uh -huh. points like this when he talks about the illusion of conscious will, right? Um, yep. and free will. Sorry, I'm going all over the place. But. <laughs> it, it gets into really interesting yeah. ethical territory. Yeah. And when you start to look at um, the defense of not guilty by reason of insanity mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, look at Phineas Gage, if swearing were illegal mm -hmm. and he just had an injury on the job, and he just started cussing all of a sudden. Right. What do you do? What do you do with that? Yeah, Sam tries to tackle these. I've heard him talk about it in a lot of his podcast episodes. I'm a Sam Harris fan, if you can't tell. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the points he makes is like, you know, could we look at psychopathy um, or antisocial personality disorder as a brain disease? And if so, if you have somebody who's a serial killer, which from my own study, the majority of people who've been caught and convicted and labeled serial killers had tr totally traumatic upbringings. Mm -hmm. And they also, um, you know, something was going on with their, with their brains. There's, the, I think, one of, the sh one of the mass shooters, maybe the Parkland shooter, I can't remember. They did a post, because he was shot, uh, did a post-mortem, and he had, uh, he, he wrote some kind of note saying, please check my brain, and he had a huge tumor mm -hmm. in his brain. Yeah. Um, so certainly we want to protect society from these people, even if they have an understandable reason for being dangerous. So it doesn't mean you don't lock them up, but it's a, an interesting thought experiment in the service of compassion. Yeah, we are quick to judge, it seems. But um, yeah, these are, these are tricky concepts. And once again, it goes back to it's uh, not 100% nature or nurture. So um, how do we measure personality? We, we referenced earlier that uh, there's lots of different theories about mm -hmm. uh, and ways to codify personality. What are some of the, the ways that you're familiar with, Reed, that we like to test for and measure personality besides your Hogwarts house? <laughs> <laughs> I like the big five personally because it's relatively simple. I mean, we use a lot of instruments and measures for that around here, yeah. like including everything from the, you know, the, the skid, um, structured clinical interview of diagnosing personality disorders to the personality assessment inventory, asking 300 little questions where yeah. we'll get all sorts of subscales, but the big five, um, I like it cause it's simple and it's what a number of the psychedelic studies have used too. Um, and because it has a nice acronym yeah. that helps remember what those, big five traits are, um, ocean. Right. So openness. And that's openness to experience, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Conscientiousness, extroversion versus introversion, agreeableness and neuroticism. We were joking around earlier that agreeableness sounds like a pejorative. <laughs> like, yeah. This person's a very agreeable, meaning they're 
Uh, I don't know. Don't show your emotions, conform to society, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Be pleasant. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so a lot of the research that's been done on these the big five personality traits also subdivides. You know, there are subdivisions of each of the five mm-hmm. personality traits that get that because you can maybe have a high openness to experience score, but there might be some subcategories on one of which you score really high, which accounts for why you have such a high composite score, but maybe the other you're relatively low in. Um, and there's lots of different ways to, to slice it. I really like Jordan Peterson's, um, I wrote it down. What's the website? Understand myself, I think. Oh yeah. Cause he has a particular breakdown of it. Yeah. Understand myself.com. Yeah. I remember going there and doing a quiz of some kind. Yeah, so he breaks down openness to openness and intellect, conscientiousness into industriousness and orderliness. And again, these terms aren't exactly face valid. He has explanations for what they mean. Um, For introversion versus extroversion, it's enthusiasm and assertiveness, agreeableness, compassion, and politeness, um, and neuroticism, withdrawal, and emotional volatility. So, yeah. Yeah. Interesting ways to slice the deck. Yeah, and it's it's not uh, the easiest thing to deconstruct. I'll throw another layer of complexity into it. Say we're talking about the experience of nervousness, which is a com a common phenomenon these days, especially in this this I want to say post pandemic, and hopefully we're getting there. But in this pandemic era. Um, but the experience of nervousness is nervousness is made up of your your state and your trait anxiety. So the traits you're born with, but also more of that set setting variable component of your anxiety in the moment, and that is more malleable. Like you might be able to do some breathing to calm your nervous system and tackle that state anxiety a lot more efficiently than you could the trait anxiety, but they both go into this experience of nervousness. Like I think we would, like any humans would have a different experience of nervousness in the same situation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It gets complicated. Um, oh, there was something else about nervousness. Oh, it's it, just kind of call a call back to what I was saying about my kid, right? If you mm-hmm. have a central nervous system, like literally the nervous, the nerves in your body, are if they are more sensitive to your environment, then yeah, you're you're going to have a different uh, sort of reaction by dint of your trait. Get these right um, in a particular state mm-hmm. than somebody whose nervous system is a little less sensitive. I'm trying to remember his name, but there was a pediatrician researcher who came up with the highly sensitive child scale. Oh yeah, and uh, coined this. I, this term and idea of uh, dandelion versus orchid children. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't love the, the metaphors he chose because, you know, it's, it's supposed to convey the fact that both orchids and dandelions are equally beautiful. And so let's just throw that out there as a starting point. But some kids require a lot more careful attention and uh, are more sensitive to their environment in terms of uh, they need um, more conditions in a certain way to thrive versus a a dandelion kid who might be able to do just fine no matter what, even if it's, you know, if there's a shit storm of environmental factors coming at him or her. If I remember right, one of the the reasons behind the choice of orchids versus dandelions is um, that, you know, if this child who might be more sensitive is uh, given a crappy environment, then their outcomes are really poor when compared to the dandelion children. But if they're given a very supportive environment, their outcomes are typically better than the dandelion children. So, you know, an, an introverted, sensitive kid given the right environment will sometimes, you know, do better academically or, um, you know, do better from a mental health standpoint, be more resilient and adaptive than their dandelion counterparts Uh but an orchid without care shrivels and it's not as impressive right yeah versus a 
pet dandelions. Easy. Right. Those things will grow through the cracks in concrete. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it is, it is, uh, it has been a useful framework for me, uh, through the years working in various, uh, areas like eating disorders, especially, um, because it does help explain why some kids with, um, a few kind of environmental stressors, say it's a, you're starting out with, uh, an inherited temperament trait of conscientiousness, or you're more prone to perfectionism. And then you have like a ballet teacher who just rides you hard Mm -hmm. and you have a trauma or, uh, you know, moving or something, uh, that really, um, adds to the stressor. And it might set those orchid kids into a pattern of restrictive eating or, anorexia risk um, versus others might not respond the same way to the same same stimuli. This is reminding me of a statement made by that geneticist I was referring to earlier. And I don't quite know what it means, but I'm going to say it anyway about parenting. He said, um, parenting doesn't make a difference, but it does matter. Yeah. Um, In in that, you know, there might be, like we've been talking about, some genetic predisposition that's going to, you're going to be kind of anxious no matter what but it matters because of what you just described. Yeah, and that's another interesting like historical uh, tidbit from psychology is is very unfortunately, you know, many decades ago there was this concept of refrigerator mothers. Yeah, the schizophrenogenic mom. Yeah, that was thought to be um you know, responsible in large part for the development of things like schizophrenia and autism, where that was extremely harmful, in my opinion, and something we work very hard these days to um, navigate in a good way, because families in all sorts of mental health struggles are often the best allies for treatment and recovery. And if you alienate or place blame, you know, what good does that do, you know, even if even if there were some truth to uh, like a parent's role in some of what happens because of their own shit they're dealing with. Yeah, yeah, right. It is mom's fault, and it's not mom's fault, all at the same time. And uh, of course, dad's. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't just the schizophrenogenic mom. No, but I'm I'm glad those um, concepts have gone by the wayside because yeah. they I think were. Um, they're an example of a really counterproductive uh, turn we've mm-hmm. taken in in medicine for a moment. Yeah, I mean, counterproductive, uh, empirically inaccurate. Yeah. Also, um, glad that we have better and more rigorous science to get us on the right track. You know how uh, Stan Groff? This is a, you know, I'm jumping to a completely new topic here. <laughs> Sounds good. But to me. Stan Groff, you know his famous quote about um, psychedelics will do will be for the human mind like the telescope is for astronomy or the microscope for microbiology and shining a light on things well i think about how since he said that there have been these pivotal papers like by carhart harris and colleagues such as the entropic brain theory of mental illness um, that you know have this complex but elegant and i think powerful way of looking at uh, how we're constructed, like our, how we show up in the world um, and our behavior is made up of, like we're essentially prediction machines and we like, we're wired to anticipate what's gonna happen and, and behave accordingly. And just like we've been talking about, there's these repetitive patterns, but then along come psychedelics that like heat up these tightly held prior beliefs and melt melt the uh, this uh, kind of idea of the brain so it can be shaped into something new. And then as it cools down, it's going to stick. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know it's not so simple, but, but it's an example of one of the ways that psychedelics really are shining a light on more and more self-awareness. Yeah, and there's research coming out of uh, Imperial College where Carhartt Harris is, um, Right, that's where he is. Uh, he, well, now he just, just moved, moved to uh, California, right. UCSF, I believe. Um, I'm just thinking of some, when I was doing a little bit of research for this episode, I, you know, found some of his 2018, and these were research studies that he was a part of. I don't think he was first author on these particular ones, but 
that showed that um, a dose of psilocybin led to changes in people's ocean profiles and their big five profiles, particularly with openness to experience yeah. and uh, not as much with agreeableness, if I remember right, but uh, decrease in neuroticism. Yeah. And then other factors like self-transcendence, not mm -hmm. a part of these big five, but... Um, or other factors, but you know, it's also interestingly complicated by the, by the fact that, excuse me, by the fact that, uh, people with certain personality traits are drawn to psychedelics. Like if you have a higher score on openness, you're more likely to seek that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a classic correlation doesn't necessarily imply causation. Um, and you have to look at those other variables. What, uh, what personality factors bring a person to that kind of work? Especially right now, right? You, it, it makes sense that openness to experience would be a trait of somebody willing to seek a psychedelic experience, given that in most places, at least in the United States, most psychedelics are still illegal, for example. Or if you have grown up over the last 30, 40 years, you've been getting the consistent message that uh, drugs will fry your brain. LSD will make you peel your skin off and jump from the rooftops. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it, uh, you've got to have that, I don't care that it's a legal um, trait somewhat. <laughs> yeah, or just the courage yeah. to like, and, and the the motive and the desire to, to track down a place to do it legally. So a clinical trial or come do ketamine at a clinic like ours. Um, it, uh, yeah, you have to be. Persistence. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and of. then lot as risk averse. That's another thing that researchers have found in those seeking psychedelic experiences. Does Low risk aversion or? Um, yeah, you're not as. Not as risk averse, yeah. that's what you said. Oh. Um, because you, you're going into some wild experience where you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, especially when, you know, if, <laughs> if you decide to go to the jungle to experience ayahuasca based on some reported experiences by somebody you heard on a podcast or, you know, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow or whatever. Yeah, um, you're you're go, you're you're exercising some courage to do that. So I imagine low risk aversion or high tolerance for risk makes sense. <laughs> you know, when I when I first worked with ayahuasca in retreat settings in the in the jungle, I was blown away by the courage, the bravery mm -hmm. of the the people, especially who had never experienced that medicine, who flew to this strange country uh, and said hello to people they'd never met, at least not in person, turned in their phones and were paired up with roommates to stay in these like open air little jungle huts. <laughs> and then after this wild ceremony where like half of the participants um, had a dark night of the soul or emotional breakthrough of some kind, we walked them back to their open air huts. And sometimes there would be a giant iguana <laughs> waiting there or a big uh, tejon. I forget what they're called in English, but these like furry jungle animal. <laughs> um, but I was really inspired by the bravery of people. It just shows the drive like in there within the human spirit to heal and to transform and to grow um, can transcend... Uh, some scary stuff like that. Yeah. You know, your description of this retreat reminded me of a conversation you and I had, have had before about um, intensives, like intensive retreat experiences, not always with psychedelics, and the potential for such things to lead to lasting change. So another thought on this, how does personality change and can it? And I'm thinking of things like the landmark experience or the Hoffman process mm -hmm. or a Tony Robbins event. Those things, of course, not without their criticism. Um they provide certainly a really intense experience where people are doing things they never thought they would do. The, the classic fire walk at the end of a, at least the power <laughs> within or whatever with Tony Robbins, you know, you're, you, because of the environment that you're in, the kind of support that you're getting. And, and again, depending on how you slice it, uh, some manipulation, <laughs> some, you know, the music, yeah. uh, Tony Robbins is a larger than life figure, right? You're doing things you wouldn't normally do on your own, which can provide for you, maybe experiences that'll help you update the way you think, the way you think about yourself, the way you think what you're capable of. Um, but not everybody who goes to those experiences who has these amazing experiences uh, makes lasting changes. And you know, you see, at least I see this sort of phenotype of a person who is this serial 
retreat attender. Mm-hmm. It's like their part-time job is to go to whatever Tony Robbins yeah. offers, or they're going back to ayahuasca over and over and over again. And it, uh, I don't know. makes me wonder. Yeah. And it also, it brings up the question for me of, uh, you know, what's the impact, the effect of the early psychedelic experiences on something like openness compared to later after multiple uh, retreats or yeah. rounds of working with ayahuasca, for example. I don't know that that research has been done yet, but. Yeah. Who was it that said, uh, you know, after you get the message, hang up the phone. You've referenced that a couple of times on the podcast. Alan Watts. Is that Alan Watts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I quite like it. Mm-hmm. Not that there isn't a reason to go back and do more exploring with psychedelics. If that's the thing that you're doing, there can be great reasons. But um, if you haven't, taking the time to metabolize and introspect and integrate your experience, then maybe don't rush back to the phone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a couple other thoughts come to mind. Just this discussion highlights for me the, the need to understand ourselves as fully as, as we can. Um, and that's a journey over time. And also Playing, playing to one's strengths rather than trying to be something you're not in a in a uh, kind of detrimental way. <laughs> like it's, yeah, it's great that um, yes, you're doing the best you can, and yes, we can always do better. And there's something to be said about that intentional um, moving in a positive direction. But there's also um, the risk of just trying to swim upstream against the grain, being in denial about um, how you're wired. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for saying that. I, you know, I've been thinking a lot about that idea lately and uh, been reading this book by Susan Cain called Quiet, Mm -hmm. The Power of Introverts in a World That Won't Stop Talking. And it's an an older book, I don't know, a decade or so ago that it was published. she talks about that. She talks about that, uh, you know, don't get it into your head that being in her case, right, in this case, an introvert is a problem just because maybe the people around you are telling you you need to be different. That It's okay to play to the strengths that are endemic to introverts, and you'll probably be better off. Life will be better. You may even be more, quote, unquote, successful if you do that than trying to work hard to change who you are. Now, of course, that doesn't mean... I think like you implied, that uh, you shouldn't um, work hard at self-improvement and self-betterment to the extent that you want to, to accomplish certain goals. But uh, those goals don't necessarily have to be change who I am. Yeah, and uh, it reminds me of one of our more common intentions we help people with going into early psychedelic experiences is show me who I am instead of like make me a different human. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up. Reed, thank you for engaging with me in this lovely conversation. Likewise. Hopefully everybody you know, found it useful. If you did, let us know. Comment, like, subscribe. Email us at psychfrontiers at uh, novamind.ca. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you, dear listener, for listening. It means a lot to me. Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers is brought to you by Novamind, a mental health company that specializes in psychedelic medicine and research. You can learn more about Novamind's mission to increase access to legal, safe, and evidence-based psychedelic medicine at novamind.ca. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're using to listen or watch. Also, if you're feeling generous today, please leave us a glowing review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. If you'd like to reach out to us with questions, suggestions, scathing criticisms, etc., please email us at psychfrontiers at novamind.ca. Thanks again. The content of this podcast does not constitute medical advice or mental health treatment. Please consult a medical or mental health professional if you believe you are in need of mental health treatment.